Good evening, everyone. I'm Sarah Loudon from Total Health Conferencing, and welcome to another edition of Inspired, where tonight we cover a very important topic, mental health. Uh, I'm joined here by my guest, Dr. Christina Pozo Caterman, who's the Director of Clinical Operations for Cancer Support Services at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center and voluntary faculty in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Miami. Dr. Caterman is a clinical psychologist and certified in sex therapy for oncology patients. Tonight, as we go through the various topics that we're gonna be talking about, we're gonna kind of cast a broad net because even though Dr. Um, Caterman is very focused on treating cancer patients in her clinic as we will uh, talk more about, um, what we're all going through collectively really has broad applications. And I think it's important to hear from someone who understands um, how to process things we're going through, especially in times of crisis, like cancer so much is. Uh, we can really take a lot from this talk and hopefully find applications in our own life. So Dr. Pozo Caterman, I'm so happy to have you on. I would like to be able to call you Christina for the rest of the Please do, please do, yes. So Christina, thank you so much for being here with us. And I, I like, I gave you a very brief uh, introduction, but I'd like you to talk to me about, you know, just your typical work day and the things that you're involved with so we get a, a context of who you are and what you do. Thank you, thank you first of all so much for having me. And I do wanna start off by saying that while I've worked in cancer for a long time, you know, I've worked um, for 27 years with cancer patients and their families. This that we're going through is, you know, totally new for all of us. So I think that this is something that we're all learning as we go along. So I'm in no way an expert on this. And I really look forward to the part of the program where we will hear from some of the people in the audience and they can share some of their experiences as well. Yes. Um, I guess that part of where I do think that what people are going through right now is similar in a sense to what cancer patients go through. Because one of the things that cancer patients often have been saying to me is they've been accustomed to living with uncertainty. Because yeah. you know, the moment you get a diagnosis of cancer, the first thing that comes into your mind, even if you have a great prognosis, even if they tell you, you know, you're gonna go through treatment and you're gonna be okay, the first thing that comes to your mind is, you know, your mortality and fear about the future and that uncertainty. And I think that's sort of what we're all living with right now is the unknown. And so one of the things my patients and their families keep saying to me is that they're coping in a sense with this whole experience better than they had anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, because they've been developing, for those people that I've been working with for months and some of them years, they'll say to me, you know, we've worked on how to deal with the unexpected and how to live with the uncertainty and not always knowing what's going to happen. So that's been a really surprising part for me. I really didn't expect that. And that's what they've been sharing um, with me. And um, you asked what I do day to day. So part of what I do is obviously, you know, um, meet with um, patients and now it's all on telehealth which is great in many ways but it's also hard because i'm sort of accustomed to you know being in person and being able to hug somebody and being there and we can't do that and i think that's something that everybody's also in some way struggling with you know we miss that physical contact because as human beings we're social um, and then the other part of what I do, which you listed as uh, one of my titles, is I oversee cancer support services. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but in general, not everybody copes by talking to someone. Mm. And when we go through tough times, there are so many different ways that people find their way to deal. And that's what cancer support services is all about. And so, you know, we offer whether it's music therapy or art therapy or massage or um, acupuncture, we have a chaplain. So it's really being there for people in terms of whatever works for them. We're not imposing um, what we think is important. They can pick and choose. 
And you know, when we, right before we started this today, we were talking that for our mental health, you know, it is helpful, right? To make sure that as women, you know, we go and maybe men too, you know, that we go and we get our hair, you know, done and we do some of that self care and we socialize with the people because that's part of our routine and that's missing right now. So really it's whatever makes sense to you and whatever makes you feel good is the way we really try to approach coping with t difficult times. Does that sort of make sense? Absolutely. You know, one thing I'm going to try to do in the short time that we have together is just kind of put um, questions in categories because I do think that each one of us as part of our coping mechanisms are almost compartmentalizing the areas that are easy and then the areas that seem very kind of difficult to plan and then areas that we just don't want to address because it's too overwhelming. Right. So, you know, I'll start with the fact that, you know, for the most part, many of us are part of family units and almost overnight. I mean, I don't know that there was anybody that felt like they had almost fair warning to prepare almost right. overnight. Those family units became locked down in the home. And so, you know, as a professional woman, the owner of my business, um, someone who works with lots of other companies in medical education, I overnight became a, a, a cook. I had to figure out grocery planning and cooking because we no longer could just say, oh, it's been a long day. Let's go out to get something to eat. Overnight, I became a school teacher, both to a 16-year-old and a six-year-old. Very different needs, very different competency levels frankly, very different stress levels. What I thought was going to be stressful was the bit, the small one, six, what's turned out to be stressful is 16 because he's dealing with a bunch of other things. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden my husband started working at home. And so just that dynamic became like, we're together, together, together. So, you know, you mentioned that you have a teenager too, and maybe I'd like to start with the differences in the adult mind being able to say, okay, we're in the middle of a crisis. There is a lot of uncertainty. There are a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of danger. And a teenager who's maybe experiencing this through the TV, through friends' testimonies, through things like that going, this isn't that big of a deal. So talk to me about that balance of the shift in all the roles we've played. Yeah, no, I agree with you. It has been tough, I think, again, for all of us. Um, and you are correct. We found out from one day to the other. You know, I remember it was like a Thursday and we were sort of thinking we may not be going in on Monday. And then the next thing I know, that Friday, they told my daughter, who's 17, you will not be coming back to school on Monday. So you really have like a weekend to think about it. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, all of us in our house, the same as you're saying, we were all here. Um, I think for teenagers and for kids in general, it's very hard in their mind to comprehend the seriousness of it. You know, they're mostly bothered by what they're missing out on. Yes. You know, occasionally they'll get the big picture and they'll realize it. Um, mostly like my daughter noticed the other day, cause she brought into me that in New York, a 17 year old or a 16 year old had died mm. from COVID. Cause now in New York, you know, they have over a hundred. Mm -hmm. So she brought that to me sort of saying, wow, um, this does affect kids. But up to that point, it's not real. Yeah. And I think that that's so often the case with young people, right? That sense of immortality is there with them. So they don't truly understand the seriousness of it. And I think that younger kids, their mind just doesn't think that long term. And, you know, if they're young, you said you have a six-year-old. Mm -hmm. Well, six-year-olds, you know, look at the cartoons, you know, you run over somebody and they just stand right back up. Right. So, you know, death and illness is not always permanent. So for those reasons, it's so hard. And, you know, I was going to, I always take it back to what I do, but you know, I've seen kids that are 19 and 20 who get diagnosed with cancer and they don't always appreciate that they could die from it. You know, they always will be very bothered that they can't go to school or they have to miss out on things 
or again, physically how they look different, yeah. but it's their parents who realize the seriousness of it. Now, again, I'm making generalizations. Sure, sure. You know, everybody's different and there's children who are very different and teenagers who are different, but in general, very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the things I've been trying with my daughter is when she brought up that, that one case, I don't want to scare her, but I just sort of said, right, you know, so you see this happened, everything is changing all the time. We don't really know. And, you know, to try to understand that we're doing the best we can for her. Um, but I think kids right now are just so excited to be going out. And then you look at the television and the beaches are packed and the bars are packed. And that I think is of concern because they're not taking precautions, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's finding that balance between getting out, but still being careful. Yes. And everyone's experience with, you know, how this has unfolded. I'm sure if you took a, a, a sample, a random sampling from a high school um, group in New York City and contrast that to, you know, a group in a mountain state or even down here in South Florida, yeah. their awareness or their understanding of the seriousness of the potential of the virus is so different. So, they're not even, even though they're having a shared experience of the sheltering and the, you know, the virus being something that's caused the entire world to kind of close down, what they're experiencing with who they know has it, who has died from it, you know, families that are in ICUs is very different. So I know that it's been a big struggle for me to not make my son Isaac, my big son, feel that I'm holding him against his will, especially while other parents are like, sure, you guys can go out together. And yes. it's like, I just sit here and go, you know, I, I face this guilt and I know that I'm not alone. Um, you know, and I'm, and there's no judgment against the parents who say, go and, you know, let their kids go out. Right. No, no judgment. It's fine. You know, but, but it is scary. And, yeah. you know, one of the things that I mentioned to my daughter, and again, all kids are different. Um, she likes to write a lot. And so one of the things that I mentioned to her is that she might want to write about what's happening and how she's feeling about it. Mm -hmm. Because I do think that in generations to come, we will look back upon this time and it's something that's going to be very major you know it's like remember when we stayed home for three months in that pandemic yes. and um in future generations we'll be talking about it so i do think if you know if you have a kid for example like she likes to write to get them to write about it because it'll be very interesting and i told her to share with your children your grandchildren this experience yes. so it's trying to find little ways um, to try to make it better, but it's not going to be okay. I mean, this is not easy mm -hmm. and it is not okay. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I was mentioning to you during, you know, before we started was this whole idea of, you know, positive thinking. And in oncology, we call it the tyranny of positive thinking mm -hmm. because we don't want to get depressed. Of course not. We want to look at the positives, of course. Um, but there is a reality that this is tough yeah. and that we go through difficult moments. And sometimes just being able to acknowledge that and sit with it, even if it's for a moment and say, you know, I, I feel really sad about all the things that I feel that I'm at loss, that I'm losing mm -hmm. or I've lost. Mm -hmm. And again, they can be your daily routine, getting in your car and going to work, the gym. I, a lot of people have been saying that the gym is not only a great place to go work out, because you can always try to do something at home, but it's that social aspect of it and being there and the music and the whole environment. And now, yeah, you can do it online, but it's not quite the same. And so to feel sad about that, it's okay. And to allow yourself to feel that. And a lot of the things on social media, you know, will say things like positive vibes only. Yeah. So it's this idea that you, you have to be positive. Well, that's good and you should try, but to have your moments, as long as you're not dwelling and ruminating and getting really depressed, it is okay. And it's actually not just okay. It's, it's normal. It's called being human. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think. 
Yeah, no, I think that that's really also something that we have, we've almost, because we've shared this and people have processed it in different ways because of the way it's affected everybody differently, you know, on a personal level, it's almost like we haven't given each other permission to express the, the difficult things. And so, you know, if you're a, an owner of a small business and you overnight saw the writing on the wall that you might lose something that you've spent, you know, all of these years building and sacrificing, or maybe it's a family business that's been passed down generations, or maybe it's what's holding up, you know, yeah. not just your own household, but the people that work for you, you know, that compared to someone who still gets to go in to their job because they might be an essential worker, you're experiencing this differently. So to not give room or permission for each other to kind of, like you said, you know, acknowledge that feeling, just don't live there. Um, you know, I think that too um, has caused a great level of, I don't want anybody to see how sad I am or how stressed I am or how worried I am. And that even might be in your own four walls where, you know, I might not want my husband to see or my children yeah. to see me grieving something right. um, because I don't want them to feel like I'm not in control. So I do think that that's definitely something that people um, are experiencing. But, you know, I want to go ahead and, uh, and say to you that um, it's okay because I think it then gives permission for the other people in your family to express it. And so I typically don't get upset that easily, you know, um, but, you know, I've become frustrated several times with my daughter, which again, it's unusual um, for me because I mean, you know, my daughter's adopted and so, you know, very wanted, I'm an older parent, but you know, I've been become much more frustrated over these past nine weeks than I normally do. Yes. And, and she's commented about it. And I told her, well, you know, this is difficult. And I think that it just lets her see that, you know, I'm human too. And I also said to her, if you get, you know, upset, I'm going to try to understand as well. And I think it just allows people to express what they're feeling. If everybody's trying to just all the time, keep it in, you don't want everybody to let it out, but you know what I mean? Little bits it's okay to let down a little bit and just express. Not that I do it enough. I think that, you know, we often try to, you know, keep a lot in, but little bit, I think it's helpful for your family to see it and it gives them permission to feel their feelings too. Yes, it's almost like, would you say that you would encourage having conversations, keeping an open line of communication yes. where, you know, you do go to your teenager or your, your little one or your yes. spouse and partner and say, hey, I haven't maybe asked this before, yes. but, you know, how have you been feeling over the last few weeks? And then, you know, how do you feel right now so that people do feel that they do have permission to share? Yes, yes. And if they feel angry or, you know, those emotions that we sometimes don't feel so comfortable if you can talk about them, as you just said, I think that that will definitely be helpful. Yes. I think anyways, you know, I, I, um, I, I definitely, I definitely think that that has given a lot of our listeners permission <laughs> to do that. Um, cause I know, I mean, today, this morning I woke up and I just, there was a memory shared on my Facebook page of what feels like another lifetime ago of normalcy and i i just was so overwhelmed i mean i literally started to cry i feel like i've cried all day today i got an email from the capitol grill saying <laughs> we're proud to announce that our dining rooms are open and i'm reading through it and i started to cry as right. i'm reading it because the first thing i thought was i can plan a date night with my husband yes yeah. Even that I was thinking like of the fear of, I hope that they sanitize and I hope that I, this, and right. it just was like, oh my gosh, like reservations are open. I can do this <laughs> yes. I to cry with this overwhelming feeling of, could it be that something that feels normal is like inviting me to come back to it? Yes. So yeah, it's, 
people I think have gone, been going through the stages of grief with this. Um, they have not. I don't think they have. And that is the, the word. It is grief. It's loss. Yeah. Um, and I think for people, it's hard to sort of, during this time, to sometimes be able to acknowledge it and express it, as you just said. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, Christina, you have done a lot of work in sexual health. Yes. And while this isn't exactly the same by any means, right. because really, I mean, when you're thinking about cancer and sexual health, there's so much going on. You know, there's disease, there's side effects from medication, you know, with, especially with breast cancer or any kind of reproductive cancers, there's the fear of acceptance and, you know, all these other things that are kind of deeper and deeper in the layers. But I do want, want to take a minute to say, you know, husbands and wives and domestic partners have been feeling a way of, we're all in the same house together. It's like family, family you know, people's intimacy levels have changed. What do you say to the everyday couple about keeping, you know, finding ways to be passionate, finding ways to find intimacy? What do you say to people? Right. Well, just, I, I guess I'm going to say that during this time, it's very different, right? So some people were thinking that if you're home all the time, you know, people were going to be a lot more sexual and a lot more intimate. Right. And that's not always been the case, at least in the people I've been speaking with. Um, so there was an idea there's going to be all these COVID babies, you know, nine months from now. And I don't know if that is really happening because again, as you said, people are feeling not necessarily that they, they can go out. So they're really stuck in a sense. Mm -hmm. And everybody's trying to adjust at the same time. And it was also sudden. Mm -hmm. So that intimacy is not so easy. Your kids are there all the time, right? So they're not getting tired. So they're having problems sometimes sleeping because they're used to going to school and running around. Mm -hmm. And now they don't really want to go to bed because they're not so tired. So it's really difficult to have, you don't have a babysitter that, you know, can take care of them. You don't have your parents maybe or friend that, you know, can take them. So the intimacy is a bit more challenging during this time. So it's very different. And I think that it's finding smaller ways sometimes to be intimate that may not always be what we would typically think as sexual, um, but doing things for each other and being physically close, if not necessarily uh, sexual, um, because that's going to be a bit more challenging. And I will tell you, um, with the people that I've been seeing, you know, on my telehealth, um, that's been one of the things that they've been commenting about, that they just don't have the space, mm -hmm. um, not just um, physical, but emotional space. Yeah. Um, sometimes, you know, when you go out and you're away and then you come back, but here you're on top of each other all the time. And no matter how much you love people, you know, um, it, it's difficult. It's challenging. So yeah, I think that there's too a layer of, you're tired in ways that you haven't been before. And also that, you know, when you are finding those opportunities to connect, it almost feels like um, foreign. It's not the old, you know, hand-holding kiss here or there. It's just like we're going through something. And I think that that also, you know, the lack of intimacy in a in a relationship leads to, to the deepening of the feeling of isolation during all of this. Right. So it's just so many layers of disconnection, spirit to spirit, soul to soul. And I think that that's definitely affecting, I don't know if you would agree, affecting the way, you know, people I, are processing each day. I do. And that's where I think that to find some small activities that you could share together, you know, obviously, um, I think work has started to take over your day. 
So that's, again, this is all is going to impact your intimacy because we're all on the computer now. We're working from home. And if you're not working from home and you're going out, then when you come back, there's this whole ritual, right, of getting undressed and showering. And, and so um, it, it's really not at all what we're used to. Yeah. And if you're home and you are all day together and your work starts to bleed into your own personal family time, then you are going to be exhausted. I think that, you know, we will develop something known as, I think, you know, Zoom fatigue. Yes. Uh, because it's different, right? It's you're on a computer all day and you're watching people. I interact with people all day, but it's not quite the same as when the person is in front of you. There's yes. something a little different. It's helpful. And for example, all my patients have been thrilled that we can still communicate and they're very grateful. But at the same time, it's not the same. It takes a lot more effort to connect to people because you're not, you know, you're not having that sort of face to face. Yes. Um, and at the end of the day, people are telling me that, you know, they're answering emails and doing things um, till late hours. So more so than usual, we're already doing too much of that, but now it's even more because people feel that they're not working enough because it's sort of like on the computer or, and so one of the things that I've really been suggesting to people, and I try to do it, is to really start to set a schedule for yourself, as hard as that may be, and to have a clear delineation between work and home. Yes. Um, and to really try as much as possible to um, honor that. And past a certain time, you're just not going to. Boundaries. Setting yeah. up boundaries, work boundaries. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was the right. We weren't doing that well before this. We weren't. And that was what was inf impacting our ability to be intimate with our, with our you know, um, loved ones and with our partners, but yeah. now even more so. Yes. So, um, you know, I do tell people limit the time that you watch, um, the news because that again can just be very depressing and upsetting. And it depends, it depends what you watch. But again, the news is there to be sensational, to get you to watch. Yeah. <laughs> so they're going to really try to make things sometimes actually, um, more sensational for lack of a better word. I don't want to say negative, but, um, and then you add to that, that you're working till all hours. So try to end the day. And, you know, sometimes if your kids can go to bed, set aside some time to just be together, doing whatever it is. Um, even if it means, you know, reading together or working on something together, not working, work, work, but, right, you know, right, project right. together, you know, you'd mentioned you just moved into your new house. So maybe doing a little project together or discussing something that you can plan. Again, you can't plan long-term. That's also very hard. Yes. Yes. As human beings, I guess we, we have a hard time being in the present, right? We, we are, we look at the past and we look at the future. And so much of what brings us joy sometimes is planning for the future. Um, you know, whether it's traveling or an event. And, you know, so many people now have been totally, in a sense, for, you know, robbed of major life events that they either have just passed right now um, or we're looking forward to be at a graduation or a wedding or, you know, so many things. So you can't do long-term planning, but maybe you could plan something that, you know, you can plan your day. Yes. And then maybe at least till the end of the week. So short-term planning. And then daily plan some things to do that may be very short, but that you can be intimate and close and share something with your partner. Yes. Um, no, I love that. But, you know, but, again, but again, that's really hard sometimes even to do because you're so exhausted. Yes. Uh, I know. I know. It uh, is. I mean, it's a new world, but you know, again, even before all of this, it's like you did have to, especially as workers, you know, were overworking, you did have to develop date nights. I mean, I remember when I first told my mom, you know, going on a date night with Jason, we were like five years married and she was like, what are you talking about a date night? You're married. Because right. my mom, my, that generation never had a date night. My mom and dad never had a date night. 
So even that was like very, it's a new concept of taking out that time and saying, you know, we're, it's going to be just us and we're going to kind of keep things kindling. Christina, you mentioned the news and, you know, we had a, a town hall on lung cancer last weekend where one of the doctors used the term um, that she was worried that we were living um, not just with a, a, a health pandemic, but we were also living with a pandemic of misinformation. Yes. And that, you know, people, that her takeaway was that we should start trying to live using facts over fear to drive our decision making. You know, talk a little bit, if you can, about ways that people can disconnect from either one side of the news being so sensational, as you said, and the other side of all of these social media conspiracy theories that, you know, they're so opposite and they're both so wrong. Talk about how people could develop a plan for healthy consumption of information. So one of the things that I'll, I'll, I'll share with you is that this applies, you know, this is something that cancer patients have been struggling with, you know, and struggle with, right? Because as somebody who gets diagnosed with cancer, there is all this information out there on the internet and it's hard to know what's fact, what's not. And everybody has a story to share about cancer and um, it be can become very, very scary. And people can become consumed with reading books and reading information. And it's hard to tell sometimes because there's those same conspiracies about, you know, cancer treatments. And so there's, again, a lot of similarities in terms of what cancer patients deal with and this situation. So one of the things that I would say is that in terms of, the, of COVID, there is so much that is just being learned, yes. right? because it is so new. If you think about it, it is something that we have only a couple of months worth of knowledge about it. And so because it's so new and it's constantly um, developing in terms of the information we get, I think that that leaves people open to a lot of conspiracies and ideas about why it's happening and what's going on. I mean, I would just say that I tend to say stick with, you know, Anthony Fauci, you know? I mean, you really want to stick with the very reliable medical resources, whether it's the CDC or, you know, um, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, government websites that really are going to be able to provide the latest things in terms of health. Really, the experts are the medical professionals in infectious disease. Those are really the experts. Everybody else, you know, has opinions. And, you know, again, those are opinions and they may be interesting to hear but you can really become overwhelmed with that information. Right. And so, you know, when, um, so one of the things that I, I like, for example, and I heard it only a few times because I'm usually busy, but in the middle of the day, sometimes um, the governor of New York, uh, Andrew Cuomo, you know, does his uh, sort of uh, news briefings. And one of the things he did, which I thought was so helpful to people, is that he presents all the information. This is the data. And then in his slides, right, because I love it, he has slides, so he's presenting, and he gives you the sources of where the information is coming from. Mm -hmm. And then he has slides which say, my opinion, yes. my feelings, right? And so I think that we could hear people's feelings and I think that's always helpful because maybe we identify with them or, but feelings are not facts. Yes. And I, I, I often find that that gets people into trouble when they take feelings for fact. Yes. And so you really want to go to the sites and government websites that are really focused on the facts. And they will give you the latest information as they know it. Um, but again, because it changes doesn't mean that they're being fraudulent. It's just that as new things are coming out about the virus, then sometimes the information is changed. I mean, you know, for, for a while there, they said it just doesn't affect kids at all. Mm -hmm. 
and then and then right and so it's not that it's a conspiracy or anything it's just that they didn't know and now they've realized that for kids often it comes quite a while later after they've been exposed and really the only place that it's been coming out in large numbers is new york Mm -hmm. um in terms of children so i i think that partly part of it is limiting the time you spend watching the news or listening to the news aside from making sure that they're reliable and and you know um websites or information you can trust yeah and it's the same thing we tell cancer patients you know people get diagnosed with cancer and they go on the internet and they start looking up information and you know it's probably not specific to their cancer any information you get you know, is not necessarily the latest because it's there. And then you start listening to people's stories and it's their story. It's not always specific about you. Um, So it's very similar to that. And I will tell you, I think that I listen to the news in the morning. I like CBS this morning because they do have some really um, sort of happy stories. They always mix that in. And, uh, and then I might listen to, you know, Andrew Cuomo. I have a lot of friends in New York. I trained in New York. And so I listen to that if I have a chance, maybe two to three times a week. And that's about it. Yeah. Because, you know, if I want to know something, I look it up in those websites. Yeah. Does that sort of make sense? I think that that's great advice because you have people that are literally, I mean, my mom is one of them. She wakes up in the morning and the TV goes on. And, you know, I I also think that that's another population that we're not paying enough attention to. Yes. My mom's 73. We live in South Florida. So we're in a, you know, she's in a 55 and older neighborhood. And it is a lot of her friends live alone or they live with, you know, an aging partner. And they already have been feeling levels of isolation and then this comes and the typical visit from the grandkids or you know their their normal get togethers at the clubhouse have all been interrupted especially considering their risk you know i brought this up with a doctor in um in kansas city who focuses on survivorship for cancer and you know for the listening audience i want to again kind of contextualize that both Christina and I our field is in cancer so we liken a lot of the things to that but by no means you know are the things we're talking about related only to patients or caregivers in the cancer space but when she was talking you know she was saying well I don't understand that because if you have a group of older people that have almost like attested to the fact that they're not seeing anybody else. They are not being exposed in any way um, to anyone outside of maybe the grocery delivery person that probably is delivering a few groceries to you know the different doors. Then there can be still with safe distancing measures, there can be opportunities for them to gather at the clubhouse or to bring out their you know, chairs and all sit in a circle that you don't have to say, uh, you know, get to the point where you're so fearful of leaving your front door. And I do think that there are people, I mean, I have to admit, I'm one of them. I have an autoimmune disease and I'm terrified. My, my fear outweighs the known risk of my exposure here where I live, but I've become crippled with fear that if I walk out the door and I'm more than you know, 10 feet from someone, I'm going to be in an ICU and I'll have to say goodbye to my children. Can you talk a little bit about how we can reset and start making safe, logical plans to kind of get back to some kind of normalcy? Right. So, so I'm going to talk. So what you're experiencing, again, it's that sort of immediately going to the worst case scenario. You know, we call it catastrophizing and it's, it's, it's not necessarily untrue because there's always that potential, right? Um, you're just living with it now in a lot more obvious way because reality is, was that even before this COVID, right? We all knew that anything could happen that could land us in that ICU, mm-hmm. right? So I'm going to refer it again to cancer until you get diagnosed with cancer, you could have also at any moment had your life change drastically, 
be it an accident or um, you know anything that can happen. But when you get diagnosed with cancer or now with COVID, we're just much more aware of it. Yes. Right? So that's what's changed, the awareness. The reality is that life has always been fragile, and it is fragile for all of us. It's only in times of something drastic happening to us that we become aware of it. And that's, we, we got to be thankful for that, right? Because otherwise you walk around paralyzed with fear. Yep. If, you were, if you were thinking all the time, oh my God, I can go out and, you know, I can get hit by a car or I'm just sitting, you know, at home and a plane can crash on me like it happened in Canada with, you know, the thunder um, flights right. were going and a, one of them fell out of the sky and, you know, landed on a house. So, but that is reality. We're just much more aware of it now. Yes. So part of it is, realizing that that is reality and we can take precautions. And so you do need to take those precautions. Um, but past that, then you're sort of getting into that territory of anything can happen. And then you're going to become immobilized, you know, with the anxiety, which I think is happening to some people. Me. Um, no, <laughs> that's so funny. Um, so I think that as I've been saying, and this is, again, my cancer patients are the same way. They're terrified because they're going through chemo and they're immune, immune compromised. And so, so I actually have one of my patients who has just missed her grandkids so much. And so she's been going crazy just being with her husband. So one of the things we talked about um, on Mother's Day is she wore a mask and um, all of them wore masks, even her grandkids who are little kids. And they went out and they live in, be they went in Miami Beach between buildings mm -hmm. and they just sat and they made sure that they all took chairs and they were all six feet apart. And, you know, they talked and they spent time together and she got to see them. And for her, that was very meaningful. Yes. Um, she was scared. And so that's part of what we talked about before Mother's Day. But it's sort of balancing. And I said to her, you know, is this really like something that's important? She was like, yes. I mean, for me to spend Mother's Day, I want to see them because reality is any other thing could happen to me. Oh. So what do I need to do? So she took all the precautions and then she did that. And it's sort of the same thing with you, right? I mean, it's taking all those precautions and wearing the mask and making sure maybe you wear gloves. You might have to do a little bit more than somebody who doesn't have an autoimmune, but you still will need to go out some because otherwise... Otherwise, you start to live in isolation and isolation turns into depression because like you said, we're social beings. I mean, we're designed to connect. So Christina, do you, is it real that the longer you stay in the mindset of fear and like you said, immobilization, the more difficult it is? I, I think it does be hard. It does. I think that it's hard. I think part of it too is sort of talking to yourself, right? So I, I often think that when we think of anxiety and fear, if you think about it in terms of evolution, why do we get scared? Why do we have fear? Well, it's actually adaptive. Mm -hmm. When we are fearful, that is our response to something that is threatening to us, right? So our body prepares for that threat. Mm -hmm. So most of the times when we perceive a threat, what that is going to um, cause the body to do is to go into this fight or flight, right? Because the fear is the, it, the fear comes from something in the environment that is scary to us, but our brain has to perceive it. So our brain says, oh my God, there is somebody who is going to attack me. There is an animal that is going to come and attack me. So I need to either fight or flee. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you make that interpretation of an event in your mind, my body, I am under threat. That whole cascade happens where your heart will start racing because you're going to need more blood to be pumped. Your breathing is going to change because you need to bring in more oxygen and you need to move that blood around. You know, at that time also, you don't need to digest food, right? Because who cares about digesting food if you're going to be attacked? Mm -hmm. So what happens is your digestive system 
you know, sort of stops in a sense. So that whole saying, you know, scared shitless, you know, yes. uh, you know, it's going to happen. So you're going to have GI upset. The big muscles in your body are the ones that are really going to get all the blood supply so they can move. Mm -hmm. You might perspire as a way to cool your body, but also be to be slippery if somebody tries to grab you. Mm -hmm. So all those things that your body will do in case of a threat to you, it's going to do whether the threat is real outside or real in your mind, because in reality, it's your mind that basically acknowledges it. So as soon as you say to yourself, or I say to myself, oh my God, if I go out, I could, and you, you know, I could get sick, end up in the ICU, have to say goodbye to my children. I mean, you just went through, you know, <laughs> fight or flight, right? Like that. And so what's going to happen? Your whole body's going to go into that. And as soon as it goes into that, since you can't fight or flee, you're going to become immobilized in that feeling. Uh, does, does that make sense? Yes. And I really do believe, I don't believe, I know, because I've shared my experience with so many people who say that they are experiencing the same thing. So, and like you said, I mean, patients that we deal with in the cancer community, I mean, that's what we're all feeling. We're feeling, we've been told by, you know, the first couple of weeks, I don't think I turned the TV off. It was on the death count, you know, the people saying this is the end, like all of this stuff, the response, no PPE, everybody's going to die. It's 10% of the population could be you. These are the people. It was like nonstop to the point where I had to say, I, I had to go none, no news. I don't want to know it. I don't want to see it because it was just too overwhelming. So I know that many of us, especially in the early part of this conditioned ourselves to have that self-talk that says, if I go out, this is going to happen. And then you started seeing, you know, well, we could only bring the iPads into the ICU. So you won't even get to hug your children. I mean, it's right. It's fight or flight. Every time yeah, you yeah. it's, it's your run to the your grocery store, the end result is you're in the ICU. Of, of course. No. And I think we all feel it to some extent. I should tell you that I do feel that. Like I go to the grocery store and I'm trying to run out of there. And I yes. notice, you know, I notice my heart is beating a lot faster and it's pumping. And I notice that I'm like a little sweaty. Yes. And so in a sense, because of what we've been told, and there is a little bit of reality to it, or a lot of reality in some cases, yes. you know, you do need to be careful. But I think that part of it is, you do need to sort of find a way to talk to yourself and sort of, as you said, maybe recondition yeah. and say, you know what, what are the things, because a lot of that comes from that feeling out of control, right? So, you know, I'm in, a, in this threatening situation and there's nothing I can do and I can't fight or flee, so I'm left to feel this way. Yeah. So a couple things that I think could be helpful for people. Um, one is to catch those thoughts, you know? And sort of say to yourself, okay, wait, what can I do about this? Before I'm all the way, I'm picturing myself in the ICU. What could I do to take precautions? And, you know, there are studies that show that if people are wearing masks and people are being careful and doing social distancing, it really can reduce of the course. virus greatly, greatly, greatly. And so if you start with that, you know, so it's sort of talk yourself down from that and sort of say, okay, what do I have control over? What can I do? And then take those precautions. And again, doing it in a reasonable, thoughtful way. Mm -hmm. But I think also one of the things that I find that helps me um, and can help people in general is something we call diaphragmatic breathing. And I don't know if anybody, and it's hard to, to demonstrate here, but um, if anybody has ever done singing or played an instrument, it's that idea that you need to take your breath down to your, down your diaphragm and you really just breathe the way you normally breathe. But instead of the breath being shallow, you need to bring it down. And so it's sort of like you just, and it's hard to see. I'm going to try to move this a little bit to see. So you want to put a hand on your chest and a hand on your belly. And you ideally want to sit back and be comfortable. And you want to take the breath in the way you normally would through your nose, in and out through your nose. 
and just make your belly move, not your chest, and breathe normally at your normal rate, nothing different. It takes a lot of practice to do that because, you know, when you're anxious or normally, we tend to breathe up here. And we call that shallow breathing, and that's actually what can bring on anxiety even. So what I say, and I do this all the time, when I'm at work and I'm rushing around, I can go in my office before I bring somebody in and sit there for 60 seconds and do the diaphragmatic breathing and sort of get myself focused and come back and sort of be able to be present for the next person that I'm, you know, that's in front of me. Yes. What I suggest for people to do is to sort of find a song that they like put on a headset and just sort of lay down or in a recliner or a sofa and just do that diaphragmatic breathing for the length of a song. Mm -hmm. Your mind will drift. It'll go away. Just bring it right back and focus on that hand on your belly moving, not the hand on your chest, but just the hand on your belly. And that can actually really help quite a bit with anxiety. I've been doing that before I get off my car and put on my mask. You know, I've I'm been so doing that. I, I can't tell you. I'm so glad to hear. I mean, obviously, I'm not glad to hear that you <laughs> have the same feelings, but it's comforting to know that someone in your position that understands kind of the psyche and how we're processing information, you too, just as a human, oh, experiencing sure. this, is it, or, you know, you kind of are experiencing... And I will tell you, I worry a lot. You know, my mom is 81. You know, she had cancer when she was young, when I was a child. And then she just had breast cancer like two years ago. Right. So I worry about her. So just, you know, everything that everybody else thinks about, I do too. Yes. It's like, I don't have a secret, you know, right. um, way to cope. I, I feel the same. And as I said, a lot of the things that I've been doing I've been learning with people that I talk to and in part what I've learned from years, 27 years of working with people who are often, you know, anxious and scared. Yes, no, uh, absolutely. Well, we've got about 10 more minutes left and I do want to get through two things that I think are going to be uh, important to, to talk about. You know, you and I were talking before the program and I was, you know, sharing with you that I did move into a new home and that, you know, the experience of being here hasn't been what I had dreamed it to be all the time we were preparing to move in. For instance, you know, I didn't get the opportunity to go to the mall and shop for all of the trinkets and things like that. And I didn't have a housewarming party. I didn't even have a dinner party with friends and family. And I said something and what you said really kind of struck my heart. I said, um, but then I have to think about people who have lost their jobs and maybe that's going to lead them to lose their home. And then I've got to be grateful. And earlier you talked about, you know, the tyranny of positive thinking, which kind of falls into that. Like, well, I have to always be thinking of a grateful thought or always be thinking of a positive thought. But you mentioned this notion of comparative loss. Yeah. Can you talk to us about what that is and how to recognize it and how not to allow it to steal what we're feeling. Right, yes, thank you for asking about that. You're right, we did talk about it. So there's this sense right now, when you look particularly at the news, or you know, you talk to friends that have jobs that they may be in danger of losing or have lost their jobs, their homes, they don't have enough to eat. So when you feel sad about something or you feel you're missing out on something, you then start to beat yourself up because how can I complain when I do have a house, right? Or how can I complain when, you know, I do have food to eat? Um, so it's this beating yourself up that is just not healthy because everybody's loss, everybody's pain is their own pain. And it's not a comparison. You know, this one has it worse than I do. It's really just, it's my pain and recognize it and allow yourself to feel it. Again, not dwell on it, but don't beat yourself up about it because then that just compounds it. Now you're feeling bad and you're feeling shame. There's no reason to feel shame. Yes, yes. So, you know, you brought up gratitude. And so I do think that it's that finding that balance between allowing yourself to feel whatever you feel, but not losing sight of the things to be grateful for. Yes. And 
Um, that's something that I learned about um, actually as a child with my mom at 27 getting diagnosed with cancer and having it recur twice and thinking she was going to die. So that whole idea of gratitude is something that I strongly believe in, but not to the exclusion of allowing yourself to feel. So whether you want to wake up every morning and sort of, you know, make a gratitude list and sort of look at it. And when I say a gratitude list, by the way, I don't mean these general things. Oh, I'm grateful uh, to have a home. No, maybe a little bit more specific. You know, I'm grateful to wake up and look at these beautiful sheets that I have, or I'm really, you know, very, very specific. Not just I'm grateful for my children, but I'm grateful for my daughter who last night gave me a hug, you know, mm -hmm. because you have to make it real yeah. so you really can feel it. So you can add to that list. And in fact, I've done that for years and then every day sort of add something, but review it and allow yourself to reflect on it. Mm -hmm. Great way to start the day. Great. But that doesn't mean that if at later in the day, at some moment, you feel frustrated or you feel like you're missing out on something, you immediately have to like beat yourself up. You know, it's not either or, you can have both. Yes. Um, I, I'm going to say this last thing. It's sort of like the range of emotions that we experience right now. We may feel happy one moment and angry the next and sad and calm. And we're going to feel that whole range of emotions and it's okay. You know, you just have to feel it. It may be all in the span of half an hour or it may be in the span of a day or, but it is what it is. And so take the positive, but also allow yourself the negative, just not that rumination where it gets to the point where you become severely depressed. Yes. And if you do, then you seek treatment, right? You, you contact your insurance and there's plenty of people now that are all providing, you know, telehealth, mental health services. Yes. Well, I mean, this has just been amazing. I, I joked with you that we could do, you know, a weekly uh, tea with Christina um, <laughs> because there's just so much richness to being, giving ourselves space to have this type of conversation. I just want to go quickly over some of the takeaways that I had and, you know, we're, we're going to rebroadcast this. We're pushing this out, um, you know, to thousands and thousands of people so that they can find similar solace and, um, and comfort and, you know, hearing that this is a normal, these things that we're experiencing are normal. Yes. Um, they're nothing to kind of suppress or push away. They're definitely nothing to feel shamed over. You know, you said to some of the tangible things, we can create opportunities within our own household, maybe even within our own friend groups, where we give each other permission to express how we're feeling with no judgment, with no trying to correct, oh, well, you shouldn't feel angry, you shouldn't feel frustrated, just give each other permission to express. Um, you said find small ways to connect, just even, you know, tiny things you can do in the day, a handhold, a kiss, a check-in, a text message back and forth with your um, spouse in another room, uh, same thing with your children. Try to set a schedule for each day um, look to making small plans because planning right now is very difficult to do on a long-term basis. Limit TV news time. And when you do tune in, look for reliable experts. Um, feelings are not facts. I feel like I'm going to get a t-shirt made that says that feelings are not facts because I too have so many of my own feelings and it doesn't matter because they're not based in any facts. They're my feelings. Um, I love this one. Don't catastrophize. Well, try don't, not to. Try not. To. Try not to. But I mean, really, I, I have struggled with that my whole life. I go from here to the ends of the earth with what could happen. And it's really, there's nothing good that comes out of that. Um, they say something like, you know, 95% of things that people fear happening will never happen to that person in their lifetime. Um, life is fragile for all of us. That's something that's not new to COVID, but definitely um, more amplified during this time. Um, catch feelings that you may be having and kind of try to, re try to talk to yourself differently. You know, what can I do? Think about it as reconditioning. Another tangible thing we can do is develop 
breathing exercises um, that allow us to just stop in the moment and, and almost take an inventory of where we are, what we're doing, you know, just at, in any way. I love how you said you do that before a new patient comes in. I feel like that's such a great way to be present with that next person because it's also given your energy time to clear. Yes. Um, so I really love that. Um, don't kind of deal with in this, in this mental state of comparative loss. I think we have done that really all of our lives. Every time that there's something that's difficult or we are diagnosed, but then we think, oh, but that person's dying. But that doesn't help us validate what we are going through um, right now. Find gratitude, be specific about those areas um, of gratitude, but not to the exclusion of honoring the other things that you're feeling. Um, and take time each day to review and reflect on those, on those things that you've listed for, for gratitude. Christina, I've loved this hour with you. I mean, Kara, thank I, you. I felt like this was going to turn into a personal therapy session for me. And in a way it has, um, yeah. but in another way, I know that we've addressed so many things that people have been feeling. And I really do want to honor you from being here with us tonight, giving us your time, giving us your experience, giving us your wisdom, sharing with us ways that we can cope a little bit better in this time. Um, so I thank you for everything you thank do. You. Thank you, Sarah, for having me. Thank you. With you again in person. In person, I know. I, I can give you a hug. Yes, yeah. yes. I can't we wait can to give see a virtual you. hug and kiss to each other. Yes. And yes. you're on my prayer list, as is your daughter. Uh, yes. Know and that you know. Family. Yes. That's what I've had to keep saying to myself all the time. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. You're not. No, right. And I do feel that when I do kind of sit down to pray for other people, it's not even in a comparative way, but it, it's almost like my own gratitude list. Actually, the yes. opportunity to think about what those people mean to me and that I can stop and pray for the things that are important to them. So no matter what your gratitude list looks like, I think that that's such a beautiful takeaway from this time together. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And you. you're right. Thank when you do you. nice things for others, that makes us feel good and it's good for us. Yes. yes. Kindness. Thank you yes. so much. You have a wonderful night. And right. You too. Thank okay. you, Sarah. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.